Welcome, everybody. Good morning. We are so happy to welcome you, Andrea Chambly, as our guest speaker this morning um, to talk about her experience of having lost her husband to gun violence. Um, so thank you so much for being here, Andrea. Uh, thanks, too, to Margaret Hilton and the Gun Violence Prevention Ministry here at St. John's. Um, for all of your good work and and the work that you help us to invite us into um, in terms of gun violence prevention. So this morning I will talk for a few minutes in terms of positioning this, um, this conversation within our Advent theme of incarnation before handing it over to Andrea to speak for a while and then we'll open it up for a time of um, question and answer. Uh, but first let's pray. The Lord be with you. God with us, you are so very with us that you put on skin and became one of us. You desire relationship with creation so much that you became a creature yourself and want our thriving so much that you lived among us to teach us how to be more fully human, how to live, how to care for one another. Help us to occupy our bodies with holy reverence for them and to occupy the world with that same reverence and care for all other bodies, uh, those, those of our friends and those of our enemies. And also give us the courage and the strength and the, the conviction to work to end uh, gun violence and all violence that, that denigrates uh, human life. In Jesus' name, we pray in whose example we follow. Amen. So we have been contemplating the incarnation this Advent, thinking about the Christian belief that God puts on human flesh in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, right? And so we've been asking what significance that belief has for our understanding of our own bodies, of others' bodies, of life together, um, in, in an embodied in, and physical world. And so when we, when we talk about the incarnation, I think that we're going a step further than the, the doctrine of imago dei, this understanding that we're made in God's image, right? The incarnation says yes to all of that, but also more, right? Not only are we made in God's image, but the human body is God's dwelling place in the world. So if you were here for adult ed last week, you heard me talk about the incarnation as an affirmation of, of the sacredness of our, of our human bodies. Um, one thing that the incarnation does is to point us uh, to the understanding that the care of the soul or, and or the, the purity of the spirit um, matter, but they are not all that matters to God about our lives, right? That we are here in these bodies and in an embodied world, not simply to purify our spirits for heaven, um, right? But to live in the world, right? to have full and thriving lives, that these bodies are actually where God meets us, where God comes closest to us. And if we believe that Jesus is the incarnation of God in the world. We also look at Jesus' own life, right? Jesus' ministry and his priorities, his, uh, his ways of being in the world and caring for people. So the cliched question, what would Jesus do, is the vital one, really, because if, if Jesus shows us how God is in the world, then as Christians, we look to his example to see how we should be, right? And we see Jesus over and over and over again, really caring about bodies, 
right? And about people's full human experience. We see Jesus feeding the hungry and restoring sight to the blind, um, comforting the imprisoned and healing the sick and on and on and on. We also see in Jesus' example, a, a refusal to use violence or aggressive force. Right? When Peter took up a sword in Jesus' defense, Jesus told him to put the weapon away. And, and weapons are not spiritually neutral, right? Because unlike tools, they are weapons, right? So a gun that is designed not to hunt, but to kill people, um, there's, there's really no way to argue for that from a Christian perspective. We also see in Jesus' example this, this strong emphasis on the collective, right, on the community. Um, so we see Jesus modeling and teaching a way of life that subverts individual rights in favor of the collective good. Right? Have a warm coat be prepared to give it away. Have a loaf of bread or a fish, be prepared to share them. So following that logic, any argument for individual rights that imperil the collective good can't be made from a Christian perspective, right? That's, it's just incompatible on that level. So from my view, the doctrine of the incarnation gives us a Christian ethic to guide our lives, right? To guide our behavior as we try to live as disciples. Because being a Christian isn't just about what we believe, it's also fundamentally about what we do with that belief, right? It's about how we behave based on what we believe. So if we take, uh, if we take the incarnation of God in the person of Jesus seriously, right? We also should take the goodness, the worthiness, the sanctity of all human bodies just as seriously. And if we do that, if we do take those things seriously, uh, and we do that because of who and how we understand God to be, because of where we understand God to dwell in the world and to meet us, then working for gun violence prevention is not simply a worldly concern, right? It is not a matter of politics, it's a matter of faith. Um, if we affirm the incarnation as true, then we have to also recognize every human body as a place where God lives, right? A place where God meets us and, and therefore to work, to put a stop to gun violence, to preserve human life in any ways that are available to us in our own spheres of influence. So as people of faith, our theology should be the foundation of our ethics, the foundation of our politics, right? To be people of faith alive in the world is to look around and to ask, how can I live out what I understand God's will and God's way and God's priorities? Um, how can I live those things out in my life and in the world around me, right? Not to force our faith on people who don't share it, but to live from it, right? To live from it and to let it shape the way we move through the world. Let it shape the actions we take, the causes we support. Um, and so in, in that sense, gun violence prevention has everything to do with incarnation um, because we believe that the incarnation, our faith in the incarnation also has to do with how we inhabit the world. Um, and so with that, I will, I will turn it over to Andrea. Um, Andrea, welcome, thank you. And you can take it from here. Thank you for that introduction and that, that remarkable explanation of of how this all fits together. Um, when I grew up learning about God, I learned about a pretty one-dimensional character. He was he was a creator, um, and and an all-powerful being. Um, he didn't have many layers. By sending his son incarnate to the world. Um, I don't know if God experienced many layers before that. I, I don't have a way of knowing, but certainly his son 
had many layers as a human, as taking on human flesh. He became a son. He became a citizen. He became a carpenter. He became a friend, a teacher, um, a force for good. He had many human layers, and that's what makes it a miracle um, that he experienced human life. And um, to um, take a leap from that, I mean, so do we all. We all have many layers. And um, in my adult life, one of my... Uh, one of the biggest pieces of my identity was my work as a lawyer. I, I always wanted to be a lawyer. I loved being a lawyer. I loved helping people. I worked in public health. Um, I, I worked to get drugs to patients who needed them and to, and to create cases against profiteers who would cut corners on their therapy and sell them something that didn't work or didn't have the ingredients or something. That was my main identity. Uh, but I had other facets too. I like to think of myself as a snappy dresser. <laughs> I was a teacher. And when I went to conventions, I never wore the navy blue or gray suits because I, I wanted my students who were mostly remote to find me in a crowd. So I wore a red suit. I wore a cobalt blue suit. Um, and I still have about 200 pairs of fabulous shoes. Um, <laughs> so that's part of my identity, too. But like all of you, it wasn't the only part. So I'm going to put this down for a second. I hope it doesn't make a noise. It's okay. They won't hear you in the so I can. Uh, oh. But I'm going to. It's oh. okay. okay. Do you need to speak? I'll just. Um, see, I have layers. <laughs> Um, another layer I have is a Maryland grad, a Maryland resident. I've been a Maryland resident since I was two years old. I'm a Maryland grad. I met my husband at Maryland. I didn't miss a home football game or basketball game. I am a Maryland Terrapin through and through, and so is my husband. He covered Maryland. Um, we didn't see each other much on evenings and weekends because that's when sports happens. So uh, we built a wonderful, enviable marriage. Um, by sharing our love for Maryland. And that was a big part of my identity. Um, but then I, I was also, uh, I exercised five or six times a week. Um, I like to think of myself as a person who does yoga. I didn't actually like doing yoga, but I liked being a person who yoga. So that was part of my identity too. Um, well, one day about five years ago in June, I had just finished my yoga class and it was a beautiful day. Uh, a lot of people had started the work from home thing then. So um, I took my laptop and I went outside to a picnic table to get a light lunch and uh, get some work done. And I started getting emails and texts from people who said, doesn't your husband work in Annapolis? Where does your husband work in Annapolis? I still think he works for the Capitol in Annapolis. So about the, I thought it was just people who forgot, but then the third one, that was odd. So I Googled Annapolis Capitol and I saw that there was a shooting at the Annapolis Capitol. And that morning, um, the day before were the primaries in Maryland on June 27th. And John had been up till about three o'clock getting the late results in and writing his story. Uh, it was all hands on deck. So the sports writers were writing about the primary election. And one of the women he interviewed almost lost um, because she decided to become a gun violence champion. And she squeaked by and he interviewed her. Um, so when he went into work that morning, I said, can't you work from home? You had about three hours of sleep. And he had said, no, they need me. They made a mistake. 
on the schedule and they gave too many people vacation today for the upcoming 4th of July weekend. So he had gone in and I knew if I had put my foot down and I said, you're not driving to Annapolis, you're too tired, I'm going to call your boss and tell him your wife won't let you go to work that day. But I knew his character, I knew his work ethic, and I knew he wouldn't let his coworkers down, and he went in that day. So I knew he was there. And I ran back into the gym that had a huge TV um, where you checked in. And they had the channel up of the reporters who survived walking out with their hands above their head and the police making sure none of them were the gunmen. Uh, I don't think they had found the gunman yet. He was pretending to be dead, lying on the floor under a desk. And I looked and looked, and okay, there was a guy with a blue shirt on it, and I'm pretty sure John had a blue shirt on that day. So that must be him. And I called his phone, and there was no answer. And I remember hearing from the police and first responders about mass shootings, about how they walk into a place where the story just broke, and everyone's phone is ringing and no one's alive to pick it up. So I decided I wouldn't call him again. And I was able not to call him again for a few minutes and then I called him again. And the longer I waited, the more I knew there was no news is not good news. But I thought maybe he ran out, maybe he left his phone on his desk. He's not like me. He doesn't have it in his pocket all the time. But I didn't hear any news. So I called my brother who worked the next town over and he drove me home. And I waited at home until about five o'clock from about three hours. And I started calling hospitals. I started getting calls from all the major news networks that wanted to know what I thought. And, and I remember saying, thought about what? What am I supposed to think about? And they w went, oh, um, I don't know, never mind, and hung up. All 13 of them that are still in my voicemail today. <laughs> um, so um, I went to my mom's, not too far away, and we waited there. Um, and my brother stayed with me, and his wife came over. And their oldest daughter was a, a camp counselor. And it was the first night out for the camp counselors for their first all-nighter. So she was in the park that wasn't you know, a, a walking distance away. So about 10 o'clock at night, the first responder showed up at my door and I, I had a ring doorbell and they told me they would have to call me, that they wouldn't tell me the news through the door, through the doorbell. Well, that's really bad news. So I learned on the phone that he did not make it. It was 10 o'clock at night, eight hours after the shooting. And, um, And I, I just went home. No, my sister took me to her home and I just cried. And I said, am I crying for him or am I crying for me? And my sister said, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it just doesn't matter. And my brother's wife walked down to the camp and told my niece that John had died. And she told me later that um, he had looked at her writing once when she asked him to do that and said she was a good writer. She's going to have a good career. And she said, boy, that meant a lot to have a professional writer tell me I could write. So a couple of kids were crying at the camp, missing their parents for their first night out. And she just cried right along with them. So my family was devastated. My husband's family was devastated. You may have heard the story that my nieces stayed awake to see their first fireflies and said, 
why is there a firefly party going on? There's no parties tonight. Tell them to stop. So they didn't really understand either. They understood the gravity of the loss, but they couldn't understand why it happened. And frankly, to this day, I cannot understand why it happened. And I think all of us agree that we can't understand why it happened. So for the next few months, I was really in a fog. They had a march the next day in Annapolis. And since I was with my sisters at Annapolis, I joined the march. And the newspapers picked it up and put a picture there that um, will show on screen. Um, so that's me. Um, and I hate that picture. It just reminds me of how I felt so full of anguish. And I can't stop looking at that and until I until I start looking around in this picture. There's my sister uh, on my left singing. She sang a um, a spiritual song and uh, it was beautiful. And that's what captured the attention of the photographer. And my cousin is on the other side looking down on my right. And she was affected too. She was devastated also. And, and then I look at all the people at this march who want to do something. All of us marching, all of us making headlines, all of us determined to support each other and to do something. And I think you can put that slide down now. I don't know. <laughs> I, sometimes I make myself look at it in situations like this, but I don't want to keep looking at it. But um, but that picture is is a story of what happened next. And I know I told you a lot about the day itself, but that story is about what happened next. So um, a Maryland graduate is no longer my main identity anymore. Could you hold this for me? Um, see, I, I brought all, all these layers with me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now, thank you. So now I'm a widow. I'm a fifth, I was a 56 year old widow, um, which I never expected to be. Um, I'm a gun violence survivor and I'm an activist. The Moms Demand Action people contacted me within a week. Um, you know, they found my number. The journalist that day of the shooting found my number. For some reason, the people who were telling me my husband was shot said they couldn't find my number. But Moms Demand Action found my number and called me and said, what do you need? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> um, somebody came over and cleaned up my refrigerator because I hadn't been eating. And all, I mean, we don't even clean out our own refrigerators, right? Someone came over and cleaned up my refrigerator because even though I, I made myself eat the fruits and vegetables in the house without John's help, it was just going bad. So somebody cleaned up my refrigerator. Um, and, uh, People just showed up to help me, but I couldn't tell Moms Demand Action what I needed. I didn't know. But um, so they said, you know, let us know. So I thought about it probably for another month or even two. I, the time doesn't go by the same way as it does for other people in a situation like this. Um, but I called them up and I said, I want to do something. And they said, oh, it's a little early. We didn't ask you to volunteer. And I said, no, no, no. This sucks. It sucks. And it's never going to happen to anybody again. If I have anything to say about it, even though I'm just one person, it sucks. We need everybody on board for this fight against armed, an armed enemy, really. Uh, and all we have to bring is peace and love and dedication and caring for each other. And uh, maybe that's not so bad. So, um, so I, 
I went to the next lobby day in July in January. Moms Demand Action has a lobby day. It started out with like 20 people 10 years ago. Uh, the latest one was about 400 people, I think 300, 400 people. Uh, I loved going to my second one a year later because all of the politicians were complaining that they couldn't get an elevator and they couldn't go by the stairs without all these red shirts in the way. They saw us. They were sick and tired of us, but they knew we weren't going away. So we gave testimony. We gave speeches. We tried to break through the gaslighting that's done by the gun industry about how Gun violence doesn't count. Suicide isn't gun violence. Only criminals commit gun violence. None of this is true. One of my favorite ones is saying, oh, they only commit gun violence with stolen guns. And I'm like, well, who did they steal it from? I came to one meeting in Annapolis and one of the Police said somebody left their firearms out for cleaning under an open window and somebody climbed in the window and stole all the firearms. So, so we, need, we need you guys to get involved. We need gun owners to get involved. We need veterans who are at super high risk for suicide to get involved. Uh, and, and veterans will use a firearm before or anything else. Most successful suicides are done with firearms. And the reason for that is because there's no treatment for a shot in the head, right? You can, if somebody overdoses, they have a treatment for that. And the person generally, almost always, 97% of the time, never tries again. But with a gun, there's no second chances. So gun suicide is the major um, source of gun violence in the U.S. And people will try to tell you it's not, but it's self-inflicted gun violence. Um, gun violence is the number one cause of injury and death for women at work. Because when women would get their lace sleeves caught in the machine or their jewelry, the government stepped up and protected them and added screens to the moving equipment. They had dress codes to protect them. They, the government stepped up and did something about it. For men, um, the number one cause of death at work for men is still heavy equipment operation. It has been for decades, um, but the government still stepped up I made lots of improvements to heavy equipment operation. There's dead men's switch. There's uh, requirements for getting enough sleep and, and uh, so many safety features on vehicles now that it's greatly reduced. But it's the number two cause of death for men at work. And usually what happens is some spurned suitor gets into the workplace and kills the woman and anybody in her vicinity. Um, the person who shot in the Annapolis Capitol was a spurned suitor. He was angry at a woman he wanted to date, and he scared her, and she said, no, I'll never date you. He had two restraining orders against him, and he was still able to get a firearm. And not only a firearm, he got uh, something called a barracuda, which is what you put on doors so they can't be opened from the inside. It's a heavy metal bar that if a door pushes out, you put on the outside so you can't push it out. He was able to get something called dragon's breath, which is ammunition that turns your, your shotgun into a flamethrower. Uh, he was able to get military style accessories to maximize death. Um, I'm pretty sure he got the Barracuda on Amazon. I've seen them for sale since I started looking. Um, you can get Dragon's Breath in just about any uh, gun store and, and some serious ammunition that turns a hunting rifle into a weapon of war. Um, so I learned all this stuff about suicide, about how we don't take stalkers seriously, how dangerous it is for women and people who are trans and people of color. 
It's the number one civil rights issue of our time. And we need all hands on deck because we have lots of dark money working against us. Um, so I'm so grateful that you're here. I'm so grateful that we have a chance to get even more hands on deck. Um, we, um, we have a saying in Moms Demand Action, and you can put up this slide here, uh, called we don't have to live like this, and we don't have to die like this. No other country in the world has our kind of gun violence. Journalists in Yemen are safer than journalists in the United States. It, it used to be any country, but Ukraine might be a little different right now, but it's a war zone here in the United States. And we are the boots on the ground. And that's what Moms Demand Action is. We're the boots on the ground. So there are things you can do. I hope you all voted in the election. The gun violence candidates really kicked some butt in this election. Um, the, the two people in my district were voted out for the state house. So we have two gun violence champions in our district. We have a trifecta um, in, in our uh, government. Um, Hogan vetoed the, the two pieces of legislation that would have um, prevented gun violence while he was in office. Um, one was background checks. I know everybody, I thought we had background checks in Maryland, but if you're not a full-time gun seller, you didn't need to conduct a background check when you sold a gun. Now, the government also has to prove that you're a full-time gun seller to arrest you for this. So all they can say is, oh, but 51% of the time I'm selling something else or not selling anything at all. So it was really hard. So we closed that loophole. Um, the, the big problem in Maryland is um, what we call the iron pipeline. Guns come up, it used to come up from Virginia, but Virginia changed its laws. You can't buy so many guns at once in Virginia as you used to, thanks to the last Democratic governor. And now it's Pennsylvania. Um, people go up to Pennsylvania, they fill the trunk of their car with guns, they park in a Baltimore parking lot, I don't know, put something out on social media somewhere, and people come to buy guns out of there trunk of their car. That's where these guns come from. So um, so our work is local, but it also has repercussions across the country. Um, but voting is so good. We got a Democratic governor in Pennsylvania coming up. So I, and, and he's um, a s survivor of gun violence in a way. He lost many friends to gun violence in his part of Pennsylvania. So that's good. Um, so in addition to voting, I'd love you to call or write your legislators. If you don't know where they are, it's in your handout. Um, I always think this is MAGA, but it's not. It's Maryland General Assembly legislation, mgaleg.maryland.gov. Um, so they will have bills and upcoming hearings and who your legislator is, if you don't know, all on that website. And one of the things we're doing this early next year in January is we're having another lobby day. And I think you can participate remotely as we did last year, it was all remote. And we had so many people participate from the Eastern shore and Southern Maryland and um, Washington County up, up in the West that we're gonna try to ha have a remote component this year as well. Although it's still great to fill the stairs with red shirts and listen to them complain about how they can't get an elevator. So if you can go, that would be awesome. Um, but you can participate on Zoom and we will be sure to tell them how many of their constituents are on Zoom. So that will help. Um, and we'd love to have you go to Lobby Day. We're working on a date yet. It'll prob the, the session starts in mid-January. So I think it'll be either late January or early February, and we'll make sure you stay posted. Um, and one thing, another thing you can do that's really important, and I hope you all take out your cell phones right now. Please do, feel free. You don't usually get to take out your cell phone at an event. And you can text HONOR to Moms Demand Action. That's 64433. And don't worry about getting sucked into a week-long 
thing or even a day long lobby day, although that would be great. Um, it, it has things if you have five minutes, if you have 15 minutes, if you have an afternoon or a day or more, they will ask for your help. Calling your legislators takes a few minutes. You call the main number, you tell them what district you live in, they transfer you, and you can say, I don't want to live like this anymore. Um, so please text honor to 64433. And honor is the word they use for people who are fellows. It's to honor John and honor everybody whose families lost someone to gun violence. So please, even if you have five minutes, you'll be the straw that breaks the camel's back. We really need voices to come out of the woodwork for this. And you can join Moms Demand Action, which has a very easy website to remember, momsdemandaction.org. And every town for gun safety is kind of like a parent organization to Moms Demand. They have um, a headquarters. Uh, they have um, fellows like me. They have lobbyists and scholarships and um, T-shirts and... Uh, so, uh, oh, and they do a lot of research. Everytown.org has this great, pretty well-funded research that tells you, now you can even look up by zip code what your what kind of safety profile you have or in your state, or if you're traveling and you want to know, or if you want to know what legislation is pending in different states, or if you want to know how many mass shootings we've had this year, which I think is 650 so far plus or minus 10, uh, we're going to break records this year again. Uh, so they have a really good um, research arm so that we can have data-based solutions for gun violence. So one of the gaslighting phrases is, well, that little change won't do anything. Every little change does something. Every little change does something. So they have the data to show what what each change can be expected to produce. So it's a terrific organization. So I'll tell you, every town was founded, um, it was originally called Newtown, after the shooting in Newtown. And then as mass shootings took place everywhere else, they changed it to every town. And that was started by Mike Bloomberg as mayors against uh, illegal guns. So he and other states were fighting over the trafficking up, up and down the Iron Pipeline of 95. Hogan refused to join that organization, by the way. It had New York, Delaware, New Jersey, um, Virginia, not Maryland. Was, Maryland never joined mayors against illegal guns. And there's an a, a interstate coalition now that grew out of that. He didn't join that one either, but maybe we'll join that this year. Call Westmore and tell him to join the, Inter the Interstate Coalition Against Illegal Guns. So that was where every town started. Um, it started out as a new town. And Moms Demand Action was a Facebook group started by Sharon Watts after Newtown. Um, and now she's uh, in charge of this, the biggest, most successful gun safety organization in the United States. She was featured in this week's style section on the front page. So um, if you haven't seen it in print, go look at it in the print edition. It's a, it's a magnificent explanation of her work. Um, but um, in that, I'll wrap up, but I'll say please text honor to 64433 um, and, and make your voice heard. And um, I mean, we should, I don't go to movies anymore. Do you guys feel the same way? I, I'm afraid to go to movies. I don't go to a yoga studio anymore, a shopping center. There's nowhere safe. Even if you're safe, you don't feel safe. We shouldn't have to feel this way. Our kids don't feel safe. They shouldn't have to feel this way. Uh, make it a new layer of your identity to become a force against gun violence um, and um, join, join our work. We'd love to have you. And with that, I think I exhausted 
my my prepared remarks and but i'll be happy to answer questions or or follow up any way you would like andrea thank you so much um thank you for sharing your story with us it's such a a, a privilege to um you know to to for you to share it with us in that way and also for your powerful invitation um into activism um questions from uh, uh we'll just open it up for question answer discussion uh if you're in the parish hall you can walk up to the mic um and i'll be able to see you there um and we should be able to hear you online from there and if you are on zoom you can use the uh hand raise function under reactions uh, david i see you at the mic go ahead can you hear me i can okay great um i'm just uh uh, building off the title of your uh, talk, um, Sacred Bodies, um, I'm wondering how could we take a page from the Right to Life movement and um, mobilize the same way they did, mobilize churches, mobilize, um, like, they were so national. I mean, I mean, uh, they still are, of course, but um, it's just, it's almost like we have to mimic some of their techniques and um, make this a Right to Life issue. I mean, and... Uh, and get churches and, and everyone else behind. Well, one of the reasons is to take back control of the message. And the right to life has nothing to do with right rights or life, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And to have the media use that phrase just gets my goat. The United States is one of the most dangerous places to be pregnant in the world, especially for poor people and people of color. It's dangerous. Um, when I went to law school, I was raised Catholic. I didn't uh, know quite yet what I thought about abortion. But in when Roe versus Wade, what became law, abortion was safer than even the most low risk pregnancies in the United States. And that was before pharmaceutical abortion. Now abortion is exponentially safer for the mother. A lot of people who have abortions have children. Um, and for either medical, financial, professional reasons, can't have another one. Um, so they're not child haters. Uh, and uh, um, a lot of them have medical necessities to have to have their pregnancy ended. When you hear people, legislators talk about ectopic pregnancies, they say, well, why don't you just take it out of the fallopian tube and drop it in the uterus? Well, we can't do that. So a lot of these women want to have the pregnancy they've got, and they need to save their own life. And it would be nice if we had a, a phrase to make it more clear that Abortion is as pro-life as it gets. Uh, um, you're, you're reducing the risk that this woman has for, for the pregnancy. So uh, in, in, many, in many cases, if she dies, her, their children will become orphans if the father's not around. In many cultures, the father isn't around, especially in the third world. The father isn't considered part of the child-bearing, child-raising support system so the the children will become orphans and starve to death so i think we have to take control of the narrative which is easier said than done and say this abortion is pro-life abortion is safer um and and it saves lives you'll have to help me do that every time somebody says right to life you can say actually <laughs> abortion is safer so hi, I just wanted to speak to David's point. I'm Jan McNamara, and uh, Andrea is my sister-in-law. My family and I are members here of St. John's, and uh, uh, John was uh, the big brother of my husband. So, um, And I've been working with Moms Demand Action since Andrea joined for obvious reasons. And so I wanted to speak to David's point about the faith community, because I completely agree, because it does seem like as people of faith, as people with this, you know, who share a lot of the same values, that this should be a, a natural uh, sort of team, and we're working on it. So, but it is tough. It is, you know, and uh, Jersey's here, and Sherry, and Margaret. Um, that is definitely something that we're working on. I've actually been working with Moms Demand Action on that interfaith idea, um, and I have to say, it's a tougher sell 
than I would have thought. Um, I think because there, um, I think because that idea, well, I'm not going to get into what I, you know, what I think other people might think. It's not my place, but it's a tougher sell. But we are working on it. So uh, before the pandemic, Anne and myself and and some others went down to a clericus for the um, for the diocese of Maryland, which are sort of the uh, more rural areas of Maryland, and uh, sort of made our pitch. We didn't get a lot of um, we didn't get a lot of of, of um, uptake, um, but I've spoken at I was actually at Temple Shalom uh, speaking to to them in Chevy Chase or, uh, early last month. I've gone to mosques, I've gone to other churches, Unitarian churches, um, and uh, so I am just going to keep. Uh, you know, Sari talked about in his sermons about being stubborn. I'm super stubborn, um, and I will keep working on it. And I invite all of you to as well. Um, and I will also just want to say to Andrea's point about talking to legislators, it's really important. And if you live in this area. Uh, Montgomery County is very pro-gun safety. Our legislators are wonderful on this topic. Um, so they're very supportive. So talking to your legislators, A, it's super easy because they're going to be like, yes. But even if they're on your side, if you do live in this area, it's still really important to call and let them know that you that you will support this because it it can sometimes feel like well of course that's just so natural and check that box but it's really important because it does become a game of numbers of like what they're going to vote for what they're not going to vote for but as far as the interface david let's talk and uh, we are going to keep uh because we're going to keep grinding away at that so. thank you um another thing that occurred to me that's related to that is you hear a lot of second amendment activists say, I need a gun because gun violence happens in gun-free zones, which is something they made up. Actually, most mass shootings happen in the home of the gun owner or the mother of his children's home. It's the woman and all her children who get mowed down by a gun. It's not a gun-free zone. Um, so if you're pro-life and pro-mothers and kids, you need to be pro gun safety. You need to be for background checks. You need to be for judges to take domestic violence seriously. The, the guy who opened fire on the Annapolis Capitol had two restraining orders against him, and he went to a required anger management class. And I don't know about your experience with anger management, but most of the people I know who are cruel to their families, manage their anger just fine at work. They manage it just fine around their guy friends and, and their in-laws and their parents. Where they don't manage their anger is around women who piss them off. <laughs> and so anger management classes aren't going to help with that. And if the judge had taken that seriously, he, he did ask, if the perpetrator had gone to classes and he was told that he showed up, he didn't show a lot of interest, but he didn't miss a class. He seemed to be uninterested in anything we had to say. But the fact that he didn't miss a class was enough for the judge. And he uh, cleared his, he expunged his record so that he could get a gun. And um, so the Reasons for gun violence are complex, but again, it's as pro-life as you can get if you're pro-mothers and pro-children and um, pro-life. There, and and if guns aren't the problem, people are the problem. Let's not give those people guns. Um, it it is pro-life. I would. I, I don't know how to argue it more fervently than that. Mark, Sarah, do, you have, uh, do you have a question on Zoom or shall I go ahead? Go ahead. On the Zoom? Okay. Well, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much. What a, what a beautiful talk. It's so inspiring. We really appreciate you sharing well, thank I mean, you. what you went through. It's so tragic. Um, and also, I appreciate your invitation to action. <laughs> and I wanted to say that if anyone is really inspired and wants to do something this week, this Thursday at seven o'clock, there's a Zoom meeting to prepare. It's a Moms Demand Action Zoom meeting from seven till eight. It's to prepare for the legislative session that's coming up. Oh, so, and you. I could give you all the details or send them out by email. 
So that's the one invitation. And the other is to say, you know, I'm definitely going to keep everyone informed as we get closer to Advocacy Day. And I'm going to be inviting you all by email and in Crossroads to participate either remotely or in person. Thank you so much. And if you text HONOR to 64433, you'll get a reminder of that meeting and a link to the Zoom. So uh, it does make it pretty easy for you to be active at, at the level that you can be. Um, as I said, you don't have to uh, turn your life over and hopefully you will never be in a position where you feel like that's your only identity left. Uh, so maybe that wrapped it up all in a, with a bow at the end. Okay. Well, thanks again for all of you for coming and listening so, so intently. Thank you. Andrea, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story with us. It's a real privilege. <laughs>